Hello, I'm David Rowan. I am editor of Wired magazine, and I've come here from London because why is a magazine guy here? Because there's something incredibly exciting happening in the payment space. Payments have become sexy. So my world is becoming disrupted just like all sorts of other industries. So I started out editing a paper magazine, but now we're increasingly making revenues elsewhere because the models have changed. And we're making conferences a major part of our business. And we were thinking over the last nine months, what themed conference should we have as a one-day conference in London in July? And we looked at education technology where there's tons of VC money going into it. We looked at medical technology, which is ripe for an overhaul. But we settled after talking to lots of people on financial technology, fintech, payments, transactions, because that's where the buzz is. If you talk to investors, if you talk to the smart talent, that's where they want to go. And just like the bank robber said, it's because that's where the money is. And if they can each get on a tiny bit of that, they'll be doing just fine. And the numbers are extraordinary. So in the last two and a half years, about $1.9 billion of venture capital money has gone into about 300 payment and finance tech startups. And it's really just the start. There's something huge happening with the internet going mobile, with simplicity of design and user experience making it much easier to get people to part with their money. And Visa Europe is at the heart of that. And if I just think of four of the companies um, I've been looking at in the last few days, just to give you an idea of the range of innovation that's happening and the speed at which these upstart companies are coming out of nowhere to challenge the incumbents. If you look at a company like Stripe, so two young brothers from Limerick in Ireland, Patrick and John Collison, they started the business when they were 21 and 20, respectively, and they received $40 million in venture capital. And these are people who know what they're doing. This is Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, who were the PayPal team. This is investment houses like Sequoia and Andreessen Horowitz. The last time I looked, Stripe had 47 employees. And what they do is they make it easier for merchants, for developers, to put onto a website or a mobile platform a payment transaction engine. And they take 2.9% plus 30% um, per transaction. And it's going crazy. So they released a number last week saying, in 24 hours, we've just processed more money through our payment system than in the years 2010 when we launched to 2012. So they're being talked about already as a billion dollar company. And we've been following Bitcoin, which is this extraordinary virtual digital currency. You create it by using computer processing power to mine it, set up by a mysterious J Japanese or group of Japanese or people pretending to be Japanese. And it's the bubble of our age. So the price in the last couple of weeks has gone from you know, up to as high as $266, down kind of within hours to $100. Um, today, I've just checked, it's $91, so your investments are safe. But it's a, it's a strange thing. It's hard to regulate something like Bitcoin, which goes across national borders pretty easily. It's hard to find out who the individuals are who are trading it. And there are companies like Ripple, again, Another extraordinary startup backed by some of the same people, the Founders Fund, Peter Thiel's fund, again, Andreessen Horowitz. And Ripple helps you transact. It's a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network, a bit like Napster. There's no central server, and people can transact with each other in pretty much anything they want, in dollars, in yen, in euros, in Bitcoin. And they take a transaction fee for enabling this. One thousand, one thousandth of a cent for each transaction. And then that's just for security purposes. And then I think it gets destroyed in the overall machine. There's 100 billion ripples at the moment. I think the current exchange rate is about 750 ripples to the dollar. And this is exciting people. And again, it's being used. It's growing incredibly quickly. It's being seen as you know, the open source salvation for people who want to transact in their own ways. And let me tell you finally about a British company that 
lost last tax year that they announced their results, 41% of their revenue in bad loans, in bad debts. That was £77 million pounds they just lost. But that was okay, because they charge an annual percentage rate of 4,214% on the loans. You probably know it's Wonga, the um, British parliamentarian's favourite punch bag. Um, but Wonga, even though it lost so much because it has algorithms that can work out in fractions of a second whether you are going to be a good risk is being valued as possibly London's most valuable current startup with a valuation seen as more than a billion pounds and it's going international. So it's got battles with regulators, it's got battles with politicians, but it's coining it and the founder sees himself as adding frictionless service to people who want to borrow money quickly. So these are just some of the companies, I'm not even mentioning TransferWise that's trying to disrupt the foreign currency transaction market, a one pound flat fee or half a percentage point if you want to transact between a euro and a pound and so on. And I'm not talking about other financial services like eToro, where if you want to play the stock market, you can follow people on the platform who are doing really well. It's all open and pick their stock portfolios. There's so much happening in this sector. We're going to talk now to a man who's been thinking about this more than most. As the Chief Technology Officer and Head of IT for Visa Europe, he has to plan for the long term as well as the short term. And a couple of years ago, he published an incredibly well-received report on the future of technology and payments that looked at a bunch of trends that were likely to be affecting merchants' lives, consumers' lives, in the next three to five years. Well, I'm lucky enough to have seen an early version of the new one for 2013 that you're going to get access to from next Tuesday. And it's packed with trends that um, are not just transformative, but they make you think and they make you realize how quickly the expectation of the consumer is changing. And there's everything covered in there from crowdfunding to augmented humans. So use the Insights app to ask questions and we will be taking questions. And you can tweet as well on Visa Insights. But please could you welcome Adam Banks. So, Adam, with all this transition, with all these upstarts trying to take a bit of your market, yep. what's keeping you awake at night most? So, I guess it's the advance in technology, meaning that the virtual world and the physical world are starting to come closer together. So, historically, the biggest barrier to entry into our world, the payment system world, has been the network. And when you look at the capabilities that are coming out in mobile phones, mobile acceptance devices, the network may become less and less relevant going forwards. And I think you talk about 1.9 billion, 300 companies. There's also the whole chunk of investment coming from established non-financial players trying to get into this space as well. And with that degree of challenge, coupled with technology moving forward, making it easier to enter this space, it's being disintermediated. So you can't really afford to keep still? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. So... The document um, that's an incredibly insightful report has seven big trends. We haven't got time to go through all of them, but we're going to go through three of the most significant as you see them now. We are. Talk us through what you see as the first of the trends that matter to us. So, if I can, what I'll just do is spin people through the seven to get a feel for what's there. It's going to be very rapid fire. Um, about three minutes to just give you a feel for which the seven are, and then we can deep dive into the three that I think are most significant for right now. So the very first piece, and we're going to do this one in detail, is all around how technology itself is moving forwards. Um, this is the only pure technology trend that we look at, and all the other seven are linked off the back of this. I'm not going to go into detail because we are in a second. The second piece is all around identity. Um, as virtual and physical worlds come together, the need for identity management goes up. Uh, there's a lot of trends we're seeing in consumer space where consumers don't want to go through an identification process, yet we need to know who they are. Number three is around big data. Um, as data 
is being increasingly collected. And again, this is true of online transactions more at the moment. We're starting to see it more and more in the face-to-face -face world. Years ago, you took 200 pounds or 200 euros out of an ATM and that lasted you a week. The spend was pretty anonymous. Now you tend to use your card in many, many environments, in many retailers and merchants. You leave a trail with that, and, and, and that trail is generating a lot of insight into the individual. The fourth one, again, this is one we're going to talk about today, is how consumers really want this frictionless payment experience. They get up in the morning, they want to do a lot of stuff, they don't actually want to pay. They're quite happy to part with money, but the act of payment is becoming irrelevant. Number five, and, and this is linked to the data trend, both organizations and consumers are starting to have to take a lot of accountability for the data trends they leave. Um, a lot of people are getting some interesting offers from online retailers related to stuff their kids have bought. Now, that doesn't make sense. We need to work out a way to solve that one. Number six, and you've referenced it, is augmented reality. Um, this covers a whole range of topics, but certainly in the UK at the moment, we're seeing a number of virtual reality things popping up. So, for example, you can now look at houses. So if you, if you see a for sale sign, you can hold up your mobile phone, you have a virtual tour of that house. That kind of capability we're expecting to become more commonplace. And then finally, the way things are being done is changing. Um, we start to see a lot more collaboration, collaboration between consumers and collaboration between businesses to achieve the outcome that we're looking for. So as a whistle stop, that's the seven. What I'd really like to do is jump into these three, because I think these three are the ones that have most bearing on us now. Okay, we'd love to spend hours on all those sevens because they're all fascinating. Just before we get into the first of the trends, I mean, these are all fundamental changes for a lot of the people here and their businesses. How do you personally keep up with what's happening? So, obviously, we have a, an obligation as, as Visa and being at the center of that ecosystem to, to really monitor as much as we can. Um, I've got an R&D and a research capability. We work with a lot of suppliers um, to, to deliver our core business. We, we rely on a lot, suppliers a lot. They've all got research programs. So on the technology side, actually, very little of this is what I'd class as primary research. What we're in Visa are able to do is take that research and then talk about what it means for payment in a way that a lot of the other research agencies can't. So if I'm an editor, you're my frontline correspondent telling me what's really happening. Absolutely. So the first of these trends, I think you have something physical to help I us do. with. I've got a little prop here that hopefully gives us a bit of a feel for what we're talking about. I know you know what this is. I don't know Let's how many people... Anybody in the audience can work out what this is. Any recognition? It's, it's a, a Raspberry Pi. Ten million of them were sold at about £25 in the first nine months since they were launched. And it's basically just a very low-cost, quite powerful computer. Absolutely. Um, if we look at what's happening in the world of technology, there's the age-old, everything's getting cheaper, everything's getting more abundant, everything's getting quicker. If I look at Visa, in the last three years, we've got four times more data than we had previously. We've got about three and a half to four times more compute power. Things are definitely increasing, but the real change that we're starting to see is the expertise you need to harness this stuff is going away. Uh, it used to be that you know, computers were like this. You needed scientifically minded individuals to plug the bits in and I'm going to turn it off, stop it flashing, but plug the bits in and make it work. Now, if someone wants a website, if you think about something like lastminute.com, you know, seven, I'd say, or ten years ago, that was a business setting it up. Now, to a certain degree, you could buy it online. You can buy by the hour website capability. You need the business idea, and now you don't need the technology behind it. You can get that anywhere you like. So what's interesting is this was launched because some professors at Cambridge were concerned at the level of mathematics science and computer mm -hmm. science among the undergraduates. So they created something that anybody could hack, anybody could write software for. Yep. And the uses this is being put to are extraordinary, from machines that pour your beer automatically to, um, I think there's even an enterprise-level phone system. Mm -hmm. So we're entering a world where technologies become democratized, where anybody can not just use it, but can create. What does this mean for Visa Europe's traditional world of you know, the physical point-of-sale device? So, so I think we're going in a really, really interesting time. So when we look at mobile capability. We're replacing what is a fairly dumb token, if you're talking about a card, with an intelligent token. We can also replace the acceptance device. I mean, that, that used to be, I'll use the word owned, but it's a trusted part of the network. It, it's part of our ecosystem. That can now be replaced by consumer devices. So we, we are starting to see, in essence, 
what used to be the online model. So, so you, you put something in the centre, you create a capability, you didn't need to build the connections out into the bricks and mortar establishment. Moving from a purely online space into a physical space where, for example, I could pay you either NFC to NFC on a mobile phone without ever needing a physical network. It can flow round the outside of the equation and it, like a contact, sorry, like a card not present transaction would do on the internet. And, and, and that type of evolution, I think, has a huge implication for us. So as well as the boxes, the hardware, we're also entering a world where there are a trillion tiny little sensors everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the big sell of what's called the Internet of Things is you'll never lose your car keys again because they'll be on the network. But we're talking about sensors in your garden knowing when to water the plants. Yep. So, Interestingly, the cost of those sensors, it's estimated that the, the base cost of a compute component now is one-tenth of one millionth of a euro cent. And you start looking at it in that context. I know IBM said three years ago there were more transistors made in that year than there were grains of rice grown. So in a world of sensors where, we'll talk about data a bit later, but you can interact with the network in all sorts of new ways, yep. that's going to fundamentally change your relationship with the individual consumer as well as the merchant. Absolutely, and I think we'll, we'll come on to that one, this meaning of your life. Um, so the meaning of your life is the second of yep. your big trends, and I think you have another do, physical device for us. I do. A rather odd prop, this one. Um, not quite so high-tech. Not quite so high-tech. This is a, I don't know if that's visible on the screen, but an all-seeing eye. And, and the, the key aspects here are that as consumers, we're starting to leave data trails that can be mined, interrogated, understood. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for both the business and the consumer to really benefit from this. Um, businesses are starting to use that data to refine their bottom lines, so, so you can drive efficiency into your business model. The consumer demand actually is getting very, very high for personalization. I mean, if, it, if I wind it back 50 years, you used to have a relationship with a shopkeeper. You know, they knew you, you knew them. Um, it was a very personal experience when you went and shopped. Right now, there's very few places in the world where you still have that connection, yet we all seem to want that connection. When we're, Good service looks like people knowing you and understanding your demand. And, and that's what I think this gives us the capability to do. This one is kind of sparked by my eight-year-old son, who, who last summer I bought a new car. And uh, we were driving along, and he turned to me and says, is, is this car automatic? So I said, yes, son, it is. He said, go on, then let go of the steering wheel. And for me, that view that people have around what automatic means yeah, absolutely is changing. And the consumer increasingly wants to have life fairly friction-free. So have a prop. I have a prop. Again, this is the final prop. This is analog. A can of oil. Yeah, very analog mechanical device. But the consumer is actively seeking to get up in the morning, get go to work, be it train, bus, plane, get a paper, get a coffee, get into work, buy breakfast. All of that could be accelerated and made easier if payment was just taken. Now, that might sound far-fetched, but you can point to a load of examples where it's happening today. Um, when London launched the congestion charge, the, the, the driving constraint, it was something you had to pay for on a daily basis. You logged on, you paid your £25, you could drive into London. Eight months ago, nine months ago, they changed it so that you can register your payment details and every time you drive in, based on number plate recognition, the charge is levied. Now, that's the consumer giving up some control for ease of use. And, and that's something we're seeing increasingly for higher and higher value payments. And I think this is a real opportunity because if you look at the way you need to engage with your consumer throughout that entire day, it's got to be wildly different in every step, in, in the sense of what I would expect to do to pay for transport. Yep. I'm quite happy to walk past the terminal and badge in and badge out. Maybe I'm not prepared to do that for coffee, or maybe I'm not prepared to do that for a meal. So the very end of that transaction chain is different every time. And I think there, again, we need to look for partners, we need to look for increasingly different risk models, how we manage the risk to make that happen. One of the buzzwords in the startup world at the moment is friction-free. Yep. If you can simplify the number of steps, you know, the Amazon one-click, the yep. clicking to download the app, 
and sometimes even a bit more murky if your kids are playing with your iPad. A friend of mine was delayed for a flight. Mm -hmm. Her eight-year-old was playing for an hour. She got a bill for £600 in virtual goods a couple of days later. So the apps that are growing very quickly try and create a user experience that's designed. Mm -hmm. If you want a taxi, you'll use Halo or Uber. Now, there's obviously attraction in turning payments as friction-free as possible. Mm -hmm. But at what stage is the consumer going to say, hang on a second, did I actually agree to that? How do you create relatively acceptable amounts of friction so that they're stopped in their tracks to make that decision? So, so again, I think this is very much where we need to innovate. The technology is there. So for, it's interesting you talk about the iPad. I was talking to a company six or so months ago who does, on mobile phones, facial recognition, earlobe recognition, gait analysis, voice analysis, and all of that might sound intrusive, but literally the first thing most people do when a phone rings is look to see who's calling. All this company are doing is turning the camera on so it's seeing your face then. Um, th- that type of technology applied to something like an iPad when you, you were playing it would very, very quickly determine that it was a child playing the iPad, not the adult that owns it, and disable things like in, in-app purchase. And this is what I mean about the, the edges of the transaction need to change. We need to have more partners in the, the equation to create those almost one-time use cases for payment on the edge. And the technology exists. If we don't innovate there, someone will. Back to your 300 companies starting up, I think a lot of them are looking at the edge as a way they can differentiate themselves.